cohesive idea, philosophy, and religious practice that has gone on for thousands of years, almost 2,000 years more or less. And it's something that is very easy to get involved in and to be a part of because of the way sometimes that we present our doctrines and our dogmas as well as our ideas about God. Because you see, the Christian religion proffers itself as a change of heart, a change of your nature into the nature of God. It presents this idea that you are going to become better than yourself. You're going to become likened unto God. And so, a lot of people, when they look at Jesus, they say, oh, yeah, I like that idea. I want to be like him. I want to imitate him. And originally, that was where one of the great mystics came up with the whole idea behind the imitation of Christ. Thomas A. Kempis wrote a book called The Imitation of Christ, and these were the attitudes, the actions, the internal changes that happen not necessarily by our own development, but our participation with the indwelling work of God in our lives. That indwelling work of God has taken on many different types of styles, you could say, of how God worked that out in us, whether it be by His providence or His nature or His Spirit working in us, we know now, by way of the years having gone through all these changes in religious practices, that it wasn't by an external means, but by an internal change that God has worked out His salvation in us. He accomplishes it by His Holy Spirit. And so we know that now. We know that the Spirit of God causes us to be made into the image of God. But likewise, we have also seen how there has been distortion as well as contortions in the Word of God to change things in such a way that sometimes people have gone off on tangents rather than develop a personal relationship with God. They have made it into a religious practice of practicing things of the Spirit than doing as the Spirit leads. You see, we have a Spirit. That is what we are given when we become born again. Obviously, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. Of course it is. You can tell. You look at it, you see it, you can demonstrate the things of the flesh. The things of the soul are a little more complicated to demonstrate, but you know that they're true because you feel them, you experience them. You have emotion, so you feel as though there is such a thing as the soul. Now for the longest time people argued about whether there would be a spirit. But you see, it's hard to argue against the Word of God because the Word of God specifically states that which is born of the flesh, hey, it's flesh. But that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. You must be born again, for without being born again you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. For the kingdom of heaven is a spiritual reality. It's a spiritual dimension, as it were. It's something that we must cast off this fleshy, earthly body to put on a incorruptible heavenly body, so to speak, that we would be prepared for the universe. It would become likened unto the same body that Jesus has. That Jesus is able to transcend our dimension into his dimension. Meaning that he's able to ascend into the heavens. So, a lot of times people get this confusion about spiritual and soul, so they tried to make it combined, and it didn't work. Because obviously the scriptures taught something different. So once we approached a consistent, regular study of the scriptures and we were able to conceive of the big picture from Genesis all the way to Revelation, we began to see the things of the Spirit and how the Spirit of God was able to coordinate facts for us of the spiritual nature, of the soulful nature, and of the fleshy nature. So religion no longer was taught as a practice but as a relationship, because it's an ongoing process of change that we develop into who God wants us to be. But that process of change also involves an interaction of our nature with His nature, our persona with His person. We must literally put on the person of Jesus in us, alive and well, and existing by the Spirit of God coming into us, else we are not children of God. 
For First John told us that, that said, He who has the Son, not believes in the Son, not receives the Son, but has the Son. He who has the Son hath life. He who has not the Son of God doesn't have life. And this is life eternal, that they should know you and know that you know you, I was sent by you. And that's what Jesus said eternal life would be. It would be the knowledge of God, the Father. And it would be the demonstrable means with which Jesus himself would say to us in the day that we appear before him, which we shall when we die, that he would say to us, Come ye, blessed of my Father, and here at the kingdom prepare for you for the foundation of the world. For when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was thirsty, you gave me to drink. When I was naked and poor, you clothed me. So there was a criteria that Jesus gave with which we would be recognized by him. And that would be those things that a lot of people say are social causes, but in reality are the primary focus of God himself. Because God said, this is how you would know that you are my disciples indeed and that you have love for one another. So there would be some obvious things that would be fruits of the Spirit of God in us that would be obvious to people around us. And that would be love for one another. Now people today say that Christians point at each other, argue about each other, yell at each other. They don't practice what they preach. They are obviously not loving one another. So. Jesus, to the person who says that they love, if they are not loving one another, may say to that person, Depart from me, I never knew you, you workers of iniquity. For when I was hungry, you gave me nothing to eat. When I was thirsty, you gave me nothing to drink. When I was naked and poor, you didn't visit me in prison. You didn't come and clothe me when I needed. You didn't give me bread when I asked. Who are you? He may say. For if love was manifested in Jesus giving his life and laying it down for the entire world, including our enemies, then how much more so should the Christian be obvious by the love that they have for one another? As well as the demonstrative means with which a Christian is obvious by the actions that they do. Feeding those that are hungry. Clothing those that are poor. Being visible visible by visiting those that are in prison or imprisoned by maybe their adulterous actions and attitudes, maybe by their addictions to pornography or their addictions to sex or their addictions to what? Drugs, to society, to politics. These things that are spiritual in nature that we can't physically remove from ourselves except that we become changed in some way. For then we would visit to them and offer them a means of salvation. To be saved from that chain that binds them. For Jesus said, whom the Son has set free, he is free indeed. And God can set free any person from anything at any time. If he so chooses. And we are the ones who intercede on behalf of those whom he so chooses. So you see, there's something that would be obvious about those that are following him. And Tozer, as we study in Vidivo Tozer teaching, we discover that in our modern times there are things we've forgotten. There are things that we've neglected. There are things that we've cast aside about the Word of God, about what Jesus said to do, about that which is of the Spirit of God. For Tozer wrote in our century, he wrote of those Pentecostals, of those that were knowledgeable of the Spirit, and he warned of those things that they were doing. He even said to evangelicals, look, you're missing the mark. This is where you need to understand and reevaluate where you are, lest you be more like the Son of Man than the Son of God. For surely the Son of Man who is not tempted would be a wonderful thing, who does not give in to sin. That would be wonderful as the Son of Man came to us and Jesus demonstrated that he was the Son of Man, tempted in all things, and yet sinned not. But he came also as the Son of God, that he would be the propitiation for our sins. He would be the forgiveness means, the tool with which God could forgive our sins if, not only if we received it, but if we accepted by way of manifesting in a demonstrative means that with which would criteria that God had already given for us to receive him. And that would be his life in us, working in us, because we would not be perfect, but we would be in the process of being made perfect unto the day of salvation, when that day we are removed from this 
corrupted flesh that we live in, because this flesh will always sin, but it is reckoned to be dead, for that's what baptism is, a reckoning of our flesh dying to sin. Now when we come up out of baptism, of course we still sin, because we are living in a body of sin. We were born in sin, conceived in sin, and will die in sin. But yet, in that baptism, we celebrate the newness of life that is yet to come when we give up this flesh and put on an incorruptible body, a body of sinlessness, that we will no longer give in to sin in any way, shape, or form. So we would become likened unto what First John had told us and warned us, that he who sins shall surely die, but he who is born of God does not sin. And we don't in our spirit. For our attitude is one of, like in Romans, Oh God, that which I would, I do not, and that which I would not, I do. Who can deliver me from this body of sin? Praise the Lord, Jesus Christ has delivered me from this body of sin. And it is yet as a deposit, as a, a placement of that promise that is yet to be fulfilled, that he who has... He who has begun a good work in us will complete it unto the day of salvation that we shall be presented before the Father faultless and exceeding joy. Faultless before the Father by Jesus himself because the Spirit of God will have changed us into the incorruptible image of his Son. So until that day, we have a responsibility to act in a certain way. We have a calling to do something more than what we are and what we've been. We have that means with which God will choose us. You see, many are called to salvation, but Jesus still has yet to choose us. And the way that we know that we are chosen is by our demonstrable, demonstrative means of doing what he said to do. For he said, he who loves me keeps my commandments. And my commandments are not grievous, they're easy. Love, feed the sick, take care of the poor. I mean, pretty simple. Smite, smack you on the right cheek, turn the left. In other words, there are things that we as Christians have a criteria in salvation. For we need, we must needs work out our salvation with fear and trembling, recognizing that yet we still have a presentation before the Son who shall receive us as sheep or reject us as goats. And for some they'll say, well, that's not unto salvation. Really? That should be interesting. Because... I don't know that the criteria says that, except that there would be weeping and gnashing of teeth, and no offense, but I don't think that I could see that salvation would be a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. But maybe you see that differently. Maybe you can examine the scriptures yourself, and to prove these things, and then being sober-minded, living in these latter days, you'll examine whether or not you were in the faith. For surely did not Jesus say to each and every one of us, when the Son of Man returns in glory in all of His kingdom, will He find faith? And the question is, what are you defining faith as? Because what Jesus talked about obviously isn't what we're doing today. God stands ready to confirm our faith in Him. This Jesus, this Jesus hath God raised up whereof we are all witnesses. Acts 2.32 the difference between faith that it is found in the New Testament and faith that it is found now is that the faith in the New Testament actually produced something. There was a confirmation of it. On the day of Pentecost, Peter stood up and then he lifted up his voice. I would remind you that Peter here stands for the whole church of God. Peter was the first man to get on his feet after the Holy Spirit had come. Peter had believed the Lord's word and he had received confirmation in his own heart. In our day, faith is pretty much a beginning and an end. We have faith in faith, but nothing happens. There is no confirmation. Peter placed his faith in a risen Jesus and something did happen. That's the big difference. As in Peter's case, it should be the business of the church to stand up and to lift up. Peter became a witness on earth as the church should be to the things in heaven and that which he was told and shown and known even as John did when he wrote the book of Revelation that which I have seen, that which I have heard, that which I have handled with my own hands even the word of God. The church must be a witness to powers beyond the earthly and the human because I know this it is a source of great grief to me that the church is trying to run on its own 
human powers. Show me a man of God and then show me what he accomplishes in his life. Demonstrate to me that effort where he steps out of the natural into what we call the supernatural. And I don't mean by throwing up some phony gold dust into the air or making some kind of declaration that, oh, you're healed, but I'm sorry you weren't healed because you didn't have enough faith, sister, brother, whoever. Or that you somehow slap them on the head and knock them down as though they were dead and then suddenly they babble as though they were children or laugh and cry and bark like dogs and wonder why. Because that spirit is not the spirit of God with which God demonstrates who he is. When's the last time you rose to death? When's the last time you proved and demonstrated that God is alive? Rather than God is alive because I feel like it. You see, the proof is in the actions and the reality of is there a demonstrative or a demonstrable means with which you can prove that God is real? Because if you're just going by faith, oh, God's real. Yeah, I, I believe it. Uh-huh. That's faith in faith. You see, that's faith in a proof someday in the sweet by and by. We'll know why that when I went ahead and tried to do, it was a lie. Because I didn't really have that faith we're talking about, did I? Did the sick get healed in a way that was provable by modern medicine? Did the reality of walking on water happened. Have you ever tried? I have. Have you ever seen the heavens opened up? And seen the Son of Man seated at the right hand of the Father? Or are you just believing it so when you had a dream and you think maybe it might have been, but could have been the pizza too? Or do you know the difference? Have you laid hands on the sick and they recovered? Signs and wonders would accompany those who believe, but the signs and wonders would not be those things that were convulsions or some type of capability of being manipulated by those who are charlatans and liars and thieves who come in and try to imitate the work of God because that which God does cannot be imitated. It's obvious and provable. Have you proven to yourself that God is real? Because I have lived the life of a miraculous and I have seen God work in marvelous, mighty ways that I don't even like to talk about because people get so obsessed about miracles as opposed to miraculous. There's a difference because, you see, God operates in norm when he's doing miraculous. When you're talking about miracles, then you're looking for some kind of sign and wonder. And Jesus said, no sign and wonder would be given unto them except that the Son of Man, you know, when he was dead and went, goes into the belly of the earth for three days and three nights, then he would come back out, you know, and be fine, you know. Bingo. Guess what? Sign of Jonah. So, the reality of all miraculous must point to, in some way, the fulfillment of God's word, revealing Jesus himself. Because otherwise, the sign and wonder is puffing up the person who's demonstrating some kind of, ooh, tongue, ooh, prophesy, did it come true? Or is it just some kind of phony, make them feel good to you message? You see, Tozer knew what he was talking about. He spoke directly to you. He spoke directly to me. He said, rubber meets the road. Prove it. Show me. And the reality is, God will. Because if you don't put God to the test in some way, not provoking him by testing him, but putting him to the test to prove that there is a God, then you may be lying to yourself and you may have faith in faith rather than faith in God, the living God, whereby... Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob all had evidence in their life that God had intervened. Peter testified to something beyond the earthly which he had experienced. He wanted to influence, urge, and exhort those who had not yet experienced it to enter in. For the power from above turns out to be none other than the Spirit of God himself. Until you've been there, you don't get there. But once you've been there, Nothing here satisfies. There is nothing less than God himself that will fulfill your life and make you realize that there is more to this life than meets the eye. There's more to living and there's more to the Spirit of God in this world revealing that this is passing away and there is a heaven and there is a hell. And there is a reality of God intervening to save to the uttermost all those who would call upon his name. You can know that. 
you can experience that. Because if it isn't an experiential God, then it's not a provable faith. And I question whether it is an actual salvation. Because you see, in the actual salvation experience, there is a reality that goes on in heaven. The angels rejoice. The angels, literally, thousands in heaven, rejoice over a soul that's saved, that God has written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Because that happens. That's demonstrative. That's very much seen in heaven. And what happens on earth, the soul that is saved changes. It is no longer a child of Satan, which is what you're born as. Your father is the devil, literally. Because you were born in sin, conceived in sin, and died in sin. Unless you become born again and you are adopted into the family of God by being born of His Spirit, where He breathes life into you and you become a spiritual life. You become no longer I that liveth, but Christ liveth in me. The life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the will of the Son of God, who died for me and gave Himself for me. You no longer are yourself. You are, in a way that modern man would like to say, possessed of. God. You are literally possessed by the Spirit of God. Because it can be proven by what you do, say, live, and God intervenes on. Things happen around a Christian. Are you a Christian is the question. And are things happening around you? Or do you just have faith and belief in faith? and believe. Be careful. You may be deceiving yourself and Jesus himself may come to you on that day with which we will have died and been removed from this world. And we stand before him and we say, Lord, have I not prophesied in thy name? Have I not done all these miraculous things in your name? Have I not done the miracles? And he says unto them, depart from me, I never knew you. Wow. Wow. What type of sign and wonder would it be that would be so counterfeit that Jesus rejects that which is done in his name? Let us search and try our ways and turn again to the Lord. Because the faith with which God demonstrated his power to them who lived in that day as Peter did caused all of them to die for the faith rather than kill anyone. The question is, when Jesus returns, will he find the faith of the martyrs in you? Or are you trusting in the strength of your arms for and about and giving glory to in Jesus' name? Anybody can Tebow, but how many can die? How many can live? And how many can demonstrate God as real and alive?